All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast and morning to the folks uh, elsewhere. Looking forward to today's topic, uh, COVID-19 in children. We talked about it in adults and our elderly, but we never talked about it in kids. So this is a great welcome conversation as we've been in school for about a month now. And I know a lot of parents and relatives and all have concerns. So we have our, our expert, Dr. Akilah Jefferson Shaw here that's going to guide us. Uh, Quick fact, fun fact about Akila, she is the youngest of five for my first boss, uh, Congressman Jefferson. She's always been super bright and smart in this bright, smart family, and her best friend, Dominique, I'm certain, is on the call. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to go ahead and shoot it over to Mia. Brandon, I love the little tidbits. I think it adds such a, a sense of warmth to our conversations every week. And this week, I'm especially excited similarly to you, that we have with us Dr. Akilah Jefferson Shah, who joins us today um, as an assistant professor of pediatrics, allergy, and immunology from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Medicine. And she's completed her allergy and immunology fellowship training at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases over at NIH, and also a residency in internal medicine right here in Washington, D.C. at the George Washington University Hospital. Um, and this is after she completed her medical training at Tulane University, or, uh, yes, Tulane University School of Medicine, as well as her BA in bioethics at Brown University, which as many of you know, is also Dr. Puckren's alma mater. So always in good company. While she, um, she is doing all of that in the medical space, she's also really highly trained in health policy and bioethics overall, having completed postgraduate degrees in both fields here at Georgetown University and also over at NIH. So we are very excited that she can bring with her today all of this background information. And in addition to the care that she delivers to her patients, she's also a researcher um, at the Children's Research Institute, the, um, their asthma program down in Arkansas. And so we're very excited again that you're here with us, Akila. I'm wondering before we get into your presentation, if we can just kick it over to the audience and then and just ask them some poll questions that will appear on your screen. And each of you, um, as usual, just go ahead and, and answer these questions so that Dr. Um, Jefferson Shaw can take advantage of this and loop it into her conversation. So first question that we have for you today is, what percentage of all COVID-19 cases are among children in the US? So why don't you all go ahead and give us, give us that, your answer for that. And then we will close that poll in just a couple of seconds. And as we're waiting for those poll results to come in, I just want to remind everyone, remember, if you have questions, please give us your questions in the question and answer box just below, right? So put the questions here. But say, for instance, you just want to interact with everyone, whether it be other audience members or the speaker, put all of that in the chat box. So interactions and discussion and reactions, chat box. Questions, Q&A, okay? Great. So let's see what you all have to say for their first question. 10%, mostly everyone is saying that 10% of all COVID cases are among children. Dr. Jefferson Shaw will let us know how all of that goes. But let's see about a second question that we have for you. We would like for you to tell us, of children hospitalized for COVID, what percentage are children of color? All right, so go ahead and submit that. And we'll give it a couple of seconds. Very curious to know what you all have to think about this. And once those become available, Keiko will go ahead and have those too. All right, most of you are saying 80% of children hospitalized for COVID are children of color. Well, we are not going to hold you any longer in, in suspense. We're gonna shoot it right over to Akilah Jefferson Shah to lead the way and help us to elucidate some of these questions. Akilah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, guys, I'm gonna share my screen real fast and uh, start just a few slides. Um, here we go. Okay, can you all see? Can you all see my slides? I think so. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of COVID-19 and children. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. As Brandon mentioned, we have a, a long history and I'm just meeting Mia today, but I'm very excited to be among such a group of, um, of wonderful individuals doing such great work. 
So I am coming from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And, um, you know, with COVID-19, as we all know, we are at about 7 million or over 7 million cases here in the United States at this point, and about 200,000 deaths. Um, among that, if we break it down by race and ethnicity in a general uh, stance, we can see that Black Americans, Latinx Americans, and um, American Indian or Alaska Natives are having higher cases, higher hospitalizations, and higher deaths. For Black individuals and Hispanic individuals, they're four times as high as far as the case, um, the hospitalization rate. And Alaska Natives and American Indians are up to five times as high for hospitalizations. So the burden of disease is really quite high. Um, and it really is, you know, lots of people want to know what's happening with kids. So on here, this is all data from the American Academy of Pediatrics and from the Children's um, National uh, Association. And uh, what it's really showing is that in California, we have very high rates of infection among children, followed by Florida and Illinois. Overall, the cumulative child cases are about 600,000 um, cases in the United States. And so you guys were right when you answered that question regarding the cumulative percent of children cases. It's about 10.5% here in the US. To note, um, between when the, when the pandemic first started back in January, the case rate for children was quite low, um, initially 0%, then about 0.1 to 0.2%. And it really has skyrocketed since July, um, going all the way now to 10%. So um, the other thing to note is that of the children who, um, of the hospitalizations between 0.5 and 3.7% of kids are hospitalized for this. And uh, with the death rate, it's quite low still among kids at 0 to 0.26% in children. Now, unsurprisingly, I think really, is that there are disparate outcomes by race and ethnicity among kids in the same way that there are among adults. So this is data from the um, CDC, and it really is just showing these stark differences. You can see the graphs with the Hispanic or Latino and a black or non-Hispanic and the lighter blue, um, really disparate outcomes as far as hospitalizations are among this group um, of children. So this is all data from March to July, and it really is showing that the COVID-19 associated hospitalization rate among kids less than 18 years old is about eight per 100,000. Um, and the highest rates are among children of color with uh, Latinx children having nearly eight times as high the rate of hospitalization and black children nearly five times as high the rate of hospitalization when compared to white children. The other thing to note is that um, 38, about 38% 38 of all kids who um, were hospitalized for COVID-19 had some sort of underlying health condition and obesity was the most prevalent one. But um, among Latinx and black children, the uh, prevalence of underlying health conditions was 45.7% and about 30% respectively when compared to white kids, which was only 15%. So again, a really, um, I think, stark uh, difference there. And then here is data looking at the deaths among kids um, of COVID-19. So here in the US, the deaths are overwhelmingly among children of color about 45% of deaths from COVID-19 in kids. And this is data from February to September as reported by the CDC. 45% are among Latinx children and almost 30% are among black children compared to white children who um, made up about 14% of the complete deaths in kids. I want you to look at this graph on the right, which is showing the child population by race here in the US and White kids make up about 50% of the um, population here, the child population here in the US, while Hispanic kids make up um, about 26% and black children make up about 14%. Um, the other thing I wanna note is that of the fatal cases of COVID-19 in children, about 75% of them had also underlying health conditions with things like obesity and chronic lung disease um, being high on the list which is very similar to what we find in adults. I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so you know this all comes down to what is going on here. There are lots of questions. Is it 
just race? Is it genetics? Is it some something with the underlying health conditions? Or is it a combination of many things, but mostly things like structures and social determinants? So there's lots of data showing that social determinants of health and structural determinants of health really have a huge impact on health outcomes in general and health disparities in general. And here, I really want to focus on it's very difficult to disentangle what happens in kids from what happens in adults. So children are at, even though they may not be the ones who are frontline workers or essential workers, their parents most likely are, and those are the children who are going to end up getting sick from COVID-19. So it really depends on the social dynamics, including your work environment, your ability to socially distance, um, your access to transportation, location of testing centers, uh, multi-generational housing, bias in medical care, insurance status, and even socioeconomic status, which we're all aware of are the social determinants of health that make a big difference in these outcomes. So I'm going to talk super briefly about asthma, which is what my background is in. And asthma disparities, um, I think, are show a, a, a very similar parallel to what's happening with COVID-19 disparities in children. So in asthma, black children and Puerto Rican children are the ones who have the highest rates of asthma. Poor children also have the highest rates of asthma. And um, we know that you know, these socioeconomic um, disparities really are driving a huge portion of what's going on, whether it has to do with where you live, so the place in which you're living, the space in which you're living, and the conditions in which you're living. For asthma, there are many, many uh, published risk factors. And as you can see from this chart, um, really lots of community level issues and individual issues. So socioeconomic status, violence and stress, pollution, um, things like access and delivery of healthcare literacy. And then to some degree, but I would argue probably a lesser degree, things like genetics um, are playing a role as well. When you control for race in these studies that are looking at disparate asthma outcomes, you really, it really illuminates the social um, and structural determinants of health here. So things like poor housing quality and material hardship, health literacy and income disparities, um, insurance disparities, and even things like neighborhood walkability, green spaces, um, redlining, and things of that nature all make a difference. So how do we tie this back into COVID-19? So there is some data out there that really is showing the association between uh, COVID-19 infection and um, exposure, as well as race, as race and ethnicity and estimated median family income. So this is a study that was done by Children's National there in Washington, DC. And they really looked um, at their community testing center to see if there was any correlation between positivity, between exposure and income. And as you can see from these graphs in the um, black and Hispanic kids, there were higher rates of infection, so higher percentages of infection, but also in um, uh, people who were in the first quartile for median family income, which is the lesser income, there were also higher rates of, of COVID-19 um, infection. They did a really, I think, nice job of doing geospatial distribution of this and really overlaying the two uh, together to find clusters of patients who were positive for SARS-CoV-2 and um, those people who lived in that first quartile as far as median family income goes. So, you know, all of this is linked together with social determinants of health, particularly with socioeconomic status. And um, I think we'll start the conversation there, Mia. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, let's just get right back right into that. Thank you so much for that. That was, oh, okay. So Keiko has started. You all can't see me. I just got so excited and just started talking. <laughs> Thank you, um, Keiko, for that. Let's 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 start where you stopped there, Akila, about socioeconomic status. Um, tell us tell us more about the connection there. And I'm I'm asking, yes, tell us more, and then I'll I'll, I'll also chime in. Absolutely. So, you know, with socioeconomic status, it really is linked to so many different things as far as opportunities and as far as um, missed opportunities. So where you live really um, matters and where you're educated, what schools you go to, and not just the substance of the schools, but also the makeup of the school building. 
um, the pollution possibly that is there, the neighborhoods in which you live. And we know that in so many places that, um, that are lower socioeconomic uh, status, that that's where factories tend to be built, where plants tend to be built, where more pollution, that is built pollution, it, um, is found. So all those things really make a big difference, particularly in the asthma world. But to link it back to COVID-19, there also is data out there showing that higher air pollution puts people at risk of, um, more risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection as well. So all of these things are linked together. The other thing with socioeconomic status is really the opportunities to, to have better uh, health care and better situations for yourself. So if you're perpetually in the state of poverty, the same cycle is going to continue to happen and it's very difficult, I think, to disentangle what happens to adults from what happens to children. It really is just the same process that continues over the lifetime um, that puts these kids at risk and then, you know, subsequently makes you an adult who's at risk as well. I very much appreciate you qualifying the conversation of socioeconomic status in terms of opportunity, right? Because here in the US, a lot of times when we do talk SES, um, we, we often do talk about it in a way that's sometimes related to personal responsibility and one's own drive and individual behaviors, right? But when, but when we have the conversation of socioeconomic status and children, it's really, it's, it's tempting to still want to follow that old line of thought or, or really that narrow line of thought but, it, but it's very helpful to be talking about a child who is born into the, his or her circumstances. It has nothing to do with whether or not they're working hard, they're babies, right? They're, they've just been here for however long on this earth, right? So I, I hope everyone really walks away with, with the understanding that when we're talking about health inequities, health disparities, we are talking the fund, about fundamental causes of difference and, and avoidable difference at that. Right, um, and I know that we're going to talk about race and genetics, but I do want everyone to really understand what Dr. Shah is talking about. Opportunity is what drives health outcomes here, and opportunity in the U.S. is tried and true tied to socioeconomic status. And if you want to read more in addition to the work that she's doing, I do encourage all of you to read Fundamental Causes Related Theory and Link and Phelan in their 2005 study or 20, something like that. Just look up Link and Phelan and Fundamental Causes of, of Health, and, and it will really help to ground you in your understanding around uh, SES and health outcomes. But let's go ahead and tease some of that out, right? So you, we're, we're, we're establishing that socioeconomic status is, the, is, the, is really the root cause, the fundamental cause of differences in, in health. Talk to us then about what that means specifically for children and then what does that mean in terms of intersectional compression of race, of, of gender, or, or um, and of course age would be a driver here. What does that mean when we're talking about health and, and children? Right, so um, in kids, uh, the first thing I think about is at the very beginning, when a child is born, what situation are they born into? What environmental factors are at play? So, you know, we always have biology that's there, right? At baseline, we have genetics that's there at baseline. But what I think sometimes people fail to remember is that environmental exposures, whether that's things like stress, whether that's things like pollution or cigarette smoke or whatever it is, really impact the way in which our biology is going to manifest. So at a genetic level, we know that there is epigenetics, which is things can get turned on and turned off or overexpressed or underexpressed based on your real your environment. And that's, you know, just that it's not really innate to you, but it's everything is, is being influenced by these external drivers. So with kids, that starts and with everyone, it starts when you're in utero and it's going to continue until you know you're an old person, um, God willing. And you know, these things, you know, have a big impact going forward. We know, for instance, that black and brown children tend to have these diseases that you find in older people, hypertension, diabetes, strokes at younger ages. Um, and that's for a whole host of reasons, things 
and sometimes it can be uh, access to, to certain healthy foods. If you live in a food desert, which is related to socioeconomic status, it can be related to stress and weathering, the weathering hypothesis that we've all heard of, that can also be related to socioeconomic status as well as to discrimination and racism, um, which some would argue in some cases, but definitely not all, if you if you sort of are, are able to get out of certain situations, um, economically speaking, then maybe you will not have as much trouble with discrimination and racism. But we know from the early weathering data that that, and that was done in black women, that even in infant mortality specifically, even if you uh, have certain educational or economic attainment, you still continue to have those effects. You're not really protected, particularly black women, from that, that, um, that impact. So going back to children, you know, really everything from the beginning, you really have to focus on the, um, I think the environmental aspects of what's happening, which always is where you live. So your place in which you live physically and kind of the larger environment in which you live, the, the psyche, um, the psychosocial environment in which you live, the um, opportunities you are and are not given based on where you live. And, um, you know, I always think back again to, to Camera Jones's um, A Gardener's Tale, right? If you plant something in poor soil, it's not going to grow as well as if you plant something in fertile soil. And children are just that. They are they're primed to, to do well if you, if you give them resources to do well and if you support them to do well. And they're primed to do poorly if you don't do that. Um, and to your point of it's not, you know, it's not their fault, right? And adults, a lot of times we like to blame them. Oh, you could have done this or you could have done that. You should have eaten better. You shouldn't have smoked. You shouldn't have whatever. Um, with children, they're just here. And they, we are responsible for the situations that we put them in, right? And so I think from a, from a larger standpoint, from a policy standpoint, we could even say from a government standpoint that that's something that should, um, should, the onus should not just be on the parents for it. It should be on the entire community to make sure these kids have fertile soil to, um, to be planted into so they can grow into you know, strong, beautiful flowers, not straggly ones. <laughs> I, love, I love all of that. The gardener in me is especially appreciative of you bringing up Kam uh, uh, Kamara Jones's um, garden analogy. So if we can find that and provide that to the people. But then also you talked about weathering and the weathering hypothesis. And I think it was Dr. Geronimus who came up with that. So let's let's find that for the people too. Um, really appreciate you you bringing in this 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 aspect of of environment. Um, I think a lot of times now, well now we're having this whole climate change conversation, but I, but really central to that is environment and environmental justice. But um, I wanted to put a pin in that for the time being and give back to your conversation around race and genetics, right? Because what you just said was, um, you were talking about epigenetics and the fact that when our environment triggers certain, well, or rather that our environment can trigger certain things in our body. And, and that those activations can be life course long, right? Um, they can be passed on across generations. How, how, how can you, and how do you help people to disentangle the conversation around, well, it's race or it's it's race driven compared to genetics. Absolutely. So, you know, race is a social construct. And sometimes that it feels too simple to say it in, in those um, those words because I think um, it doesn't really drive the, the point home. But race is a social construct. It has no biologic or genetic underpinnings whatsoever. It was made as a means to to separate people into certain groups based on sometimes preference, sometimes the way that you look, sometimes wherever you're from. Um, but it was not, it was never based in any biology or um, genetic theories that were of any substance. So that's number one. Number two, people, you know, there are all these studies out there trying to say, um, or that have looked for black genes, white genes, Hispanic genes, whatever it is, to explain away um, some of these disparities that we see in health outcomes. And for decades and decades and decades, we've not been able to find them um, because they don't exist. 
right? Um, when the Human Genome Project was done, um, it found that, you know, genetic uh, dis or genetic variation, I'll say, is often more among races, so between you and I, than it is across races, so between me and um, my white friend. Um, and so that, I think, really pushed home the, the idea that there is not a genetic basis for this, despite clearly there are uh, phenotypic differences, right? We look different in, from different places. Um, you can have different skin tone, you can have different hair texture, you can have all these things that are uh, kind of variations and phenotypic changes, but not genetic changes. Um, and so I try to explain things in that way. The other thing is there's this idea of ancestry and what is ancestry versus race versus genetics. So ancestry oftentimes correlates more with genetics than race does. Race is a social construct, but you can have genetic ancestry among subgroups of people who originated from similar places um, where you can have certain disease processes that are more genetic variants that that uh, that kind of go into certain disease processes that are more prevalent in certain populations. That certainly can happen. You can see it with cystic fibrosis. You can see it with many different things. But that's not a, it's not a, a race thing. It's a genetic variation um, issue. And so I, I feel like I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but I try to just always say if race is a social construct, it was made for a specific purpose. Um, genetics is something completely different, and we know that if you measure genetics across races and within races, you'll see, you'll be, I think not, you shouldn't be surprised, but you may, some people may be surprised by the, the, um, the, uh, how, how similar all of us all are, really, when it comes down to it, and that all Black people don't have Black genes, white people don't have white genes, it's not a thing at all. And, you know, it's interesting because as simplistic as it sounds, that is, in, in terms of the last thing that you said, that is what resonates with older, older people and also with little people, right? So when I talk to my nieces and nephews about what race is, I literally use terms just like that. It's not that we have black genes or we have white genes, you know, but we have to get dressed as as concrete and um, you have to get in the weeds and then you have to bring it to, to a child's voice, even for adults who really still a lot of times want to insist that it's a race thing, right? But no, it's not. Thank you for that. That was, that was, um, that was, that was really spot on. I want to, I want to talk more about your work in, in, in asthma, All right? I'm hoping that you can help us to understand for those of us who don't have asthma and really for, and to give voice to those who do, it's a painful, attacks are quite painful, right? Um, and similarly with COVID-19, um, the symptoms, if one is, symptoma is symptomatic, are also painful. So can you help draw some parallels for us in terms of what, what it feels like? Yeah. So um, asthma kind of at a, a biologic level is, is something that increases inflammation in your airway. It increases mucus production in your airway and it increases um, contractility or kind of spasms of your airway. And when all that happens, the inflammation can be painful. It can cause uh, narrowing. The mucus is, can cause blockages, um, and the kind of spasms can just make it really difficult to have any any purposeful air exchange in those situations. Um, asthma is also usually triggered by some external stimuli. So whether that is an allergy, if you have ragweed allergies or pollen allergies or whatever it is, it can be a virus, like a flu virus or a coronavirus. Um, it can be something like a fumes, a pollution that can trigger its smoke in some people. So usually an external thing that triggers it, though there are people who have just kind of innate asthma that are, that's very difficult to control, that doesn't have any super clear external triggers, but that's not the usual case. Um, so that's the reason why we often focus a lot on the environment and what's happening around people that's putting them at risk for those exacerbations and those triggers and those poorer health outcomes. With COVID-19, 
you can, I think you can think of it in a similar way. So you have some sort of external stimuli, which is SARS-CoV-2 virus that is inhaled through your nose or through your mouth or some other mucous membrane and then can cause, and some people, if you have severe symptoms, can cause um, mucus or fluid buildup in the lungs. It can cause decreased elasticity. It can cause this pneumonia-like picture or ARDS-like picture um, in the lungs um, and really compromise your ability to exchange oxygen, which is the, the, um, the really unfortunate part of it, which causes people to need to be on ventilators and things like that. Um, so the underlying process is, a, is different for sure, but the outcomes as far as the symptoms that people have is sometimes very, a lot of overlap between the two. Um, and so I think, you know, really just being so aware of what's around us is really the way that you deal with both of them, right? So with SARS-CoV-2, you wanna make sure you're not around people who are sick as much as possible. You wanna make sure you're wearing a mask to block those external things. You wanna make sure you're staying indoors and out of crowds as much as possible. And for asthma, you wanna make sure you're not around the person who's smoking, who's gonna trigger your asthma, or you don't go to the park when the pollen is really high or whatever that external trigger is for you to really um, make things a little bit easier uh, as, as you go forward. It's, it's interesting because um, it's, it's quite clear that with asthma, there are things outside of you that trigger, but with COVID, you can be the outside trigger, right? You can be the harmful pathogen, which is why whether or not one is positive following the protocols and the proper protocols in terms of safe physical distancing, wearing one's mask properly, which um, in, in previous uh, episodes of our webinar, Dr. Um, Shanina Knighton has come and, and delivered some really very beautiful and comprehensive graphics to, to help our audience to really think through those, right? And it, it's this, overall, it's this sense of, of uh, public good that I think we we hold for asthma, right? We have this idea, especially that we want to take care of the person with asthma. But I don't know yet that the American public has completely um, ca carries the same level of of good and public good of wanting to take care of those who are not yet sick or who are potentially able to become sick because of COVID, and therefore are might be a little lax with their own protocols, right? So. We just want to take care of each other, whether it's asthma or any level of coronavirus, as you mentioned, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about, about uh, perception, right? So about a month ago, we had representative, um, State Representative Ted James on to talk about his, um, his battle with, with COVID. And you know, he's, he doesn't have any underlying conditions. He's a healthy man, very active, um, builds up his nutrition, all of that. Um, he, he contracted COVID, doesn't know how, was fighting for his life. He got better. And then it was also determined that his daughter had COVID. Who, and I think his daughter is not even four or something like that. Um, and so talk to us about what the perception is of children themselves being carriers of the virus. And how do you talk to patients um, as in adults with children who have, you know, in, in terms of their vulnerability? Right. So, you know, I think the, the, I think the conversation has really evolved um, in a good way, which, which is, is good. Um, at the very beginning, so I remember back in March when um, I think, you know, that's really when stuff started to really go crazy uh, with cases really increasing, with um, the worry uh, really starting among many um, health professionals and in the general public. And, you know, I work at a children's hospital. And at that time, the thought really was, well, kids don't get sick. So we don't need to worry so much about our clinics. We don't need to worry about our patients. I take care of asthmatics. So we were all, all kind of on uh, high alert because um, at that point we did not know how a respiratory virus of this nature was going to impact that patient population. But there was a general sense, I would say, that kids are okay. Then about a week later, we started thinking more about it and saying that doesn't really make sense because kids live with their parents 
They live with their grandparents. They're gonna, you know, who's bringing them to these appointments? Who is bringing them to school? Who's teaching them at school? Who is doing all these things? And so you can't, again, disentangle children from adults that easily. Um, the next question was how contagious are kids? Are they really driving infection? Let's say even if they don't get super sick all the time. And that question I think is still out there. There's data that's coming out showing that it looks like adolescents get get uh, get the virus as uh, at similar rates as adults, um, but younger kids may not get it as often if they're exposed to someone who's positive. But regarding the kind of um, infectiousness of of children, it's really unclear. Though we know that kids can spread the virus. Um, even though they're not always the ones who are going to have major symptoms from the virus. So, you know, I think the the um, conversation has evolved a bit where we're being a bit more critical and sensitive to the fact that number one, children are not in a bubble. Um, and number two, they, even if it doesn't happen often, can get very sick. Um, either with the normal COVID-19 or with the multi-system inflammatory syndromes. Um, and for a lot of us, myself included, if one child dies, that should not be acceptable. Um, if two children die, that should not be acceptable in the same way that if one adult dies, that should not be acceptable. Um, and so we all, you know, just have to be, I think, a bit more I don't know the right word. I don't want to say smart about it, but a bit more um, sensitive to it that, you know, if it's your child, then you might feel a bit differently than than people who kind of are cavalier about about this right now. Um, and keeping kids at kids healthy, but then also keeping their caretakers ha uh, healthy, whether it's a teacher or their parents or their grandmother, um, and that you can't separate all of that out so easily as much as we want to. Have you had patients, uh, pediatric patients, that are COVID positive or have your colleagues? I have not had any um, any of my patients personally who are COVID positive. Mm -hmm. um, I know several kids who are not my patients who are COVID positive, um, who have all thankfully done well um, and done okay. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's, it's scary, right? Because again, just like we've mentioned before, a lot of times with adults, people say, oh, maybe you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that, or which I think is is bogus anyway, particularly with COVID-19, because we know that the situations that people are in a lot of times with work and other things like that, they cannot um, socially distance or they cannot call out sick or anything. Um, but with kids in particular, you know, this idea of, of vulnerability, of especially being vulnerable, um, I think really hits home. And just the fear, even though it's, you know, zero point whatever percent of kids who actually pass away from this, um, that just if it's yours, if it's your kid, that's, you know, that makes a big difference, right? And that we have to think about it in that way that if it's your child or your neighbor's child or someone across the country's child, you should still care about it and um, and really work to, to not put these children at risk, particularly because they're so vulnerable in so many different ways already. If nothing else, the conversation with, with respect to COVID-19 and children should be an empathy builder mm -hmm. and that empathy should really extend to all people, right? Yes. So if we're finding, if the American public is having trouble really um, building up their empathy around those who are most vulnerable. Just think of children. And it's literally the same feeling that we can be able to practice and extend to others, right? Yeah. Um, again, audience, if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer box. We want to make sure that, uh, that Dr. Akila has them to, to answer. I want to talk to you, though, about the fact that children are now back in school, whatever that means, right? Now, I have very close friends whose children are too young to be virtually engaged. So they are in daycare, they are in um, preschool. What, what, are the, what are some of the things that you all as physicians who care for children are passing on as best practices for, for people who are providers and also for parents whose children may come home with the sniffles and all of a sudden they're just like, oh my God, is this COVID? Yeah. You know? 
So, so number one, I think that everyone needs to, the, the advice I give is everyone needs to kind of be on their toes, number one. So um, for instance, if it's the sniffles, it may be COVID, it may be allergies, it may be, you know, a whole host of other things it could be another respiratory virus. But given the nature of what is going on now, that we have to be on our toes and we shouldn't brush things off as, as um, maybe we once would a year ago, that is not a big deal. Um, and it's really because the implications of one case, let's say in a daycare, really to, to that, that entire daycare, all the children, all the adults, their families, and so on and so forth, really is, is a big deal. And so we can't be so cavalier about it. So number one, um, you know, smaller sizes of classrooms and of, um, of daycares is really helping. We know that if we can spread children out in the same way that if we spread adults out, it really helps decrease the amount of spread that's going on. Number two, if there's any way to kind of cluster people together, so you have your little cohort, so this class always stays together and this class always stays together. So if there is an infection in one of those cohorts, you can just quarantine that one cohort and you don't have to quarantine the entire school. And that seems to be working quite well. Um, contact tracing in that way makes it a lot easier because we can just really get to those few contacts um, and their families and their other contacts and really test and isolate as much as we need to. Um, and then, of course, the normal things, masks and hand washing and kind of personal hygiene, wiping down desks, all those types of things we know help decrease the spread. Um, and the last thing I'll mention really is ventilation. Uh, as much as possible, not having kids crammed into poorly ventilated areas. If we can be outside, outside is always going to be better than being inside, which will be a challenge uh, in the coming months as it gets colder. And, you know, I think we're all well aware of that. So I'll, maybe we'll talk about flu in a bit, but that's another whole conversation to have to really, to really um, make sure we're, we're protecting ourselves and preparing ourselves as much as possible as the cold seasons um, start to come in many parts of the U.S. Actually, let's stay with that. And then I have another, another question for you. So um, <laughs> flu season. So flu season really starts like now. It's, um, we're at the end of, uh, actually we're at the beginning of October, gosh. And um, flu season starts now. It takes about two weeks for your flu shot once you get it to work. Um, so I recommend it starting back in like September for people to start getting a flu shot. Now, historically, Americans um, are under vaccinated for flu, meaning like 30 to 40% of people actually get flu shots. Uh, people of color are uh, even less vaccinated for flu. They tend to get it less often. Um, and then there are polls that are coming out that saying up to 50% of, of parents are saying that they don't wanna vaccinate their kids to flu this year for many reasons. One. You don't want to go to the doctor's office and potentially get exposed to anything there. And number two, people are just very wary about these vaccines these days in general. And what I would say to that is the flu vaccine is highly safe. It's highly effective um, most of the time. No vaccine is 100% effective um, across the board, but flu vaccine, generally speaking, they do a very good job of um, really uh, figuring out which strains of the flu are going to be the most prevalent ones. Um, and also, we know that it's not just for you, right? So we need to have some level of immunity among the population so that this flu cannot spread to you, your little sister, your mom, your grandmother, your grandfather, all these other contacts that you have, or even your classmates in school. So, you know, it again goes back to that. Everyone needs to be thinking less individually and more kind of community-wide about things like flu and other infectious diseases like COVID-19 um, in order to really uh, control it. Um, and then the last thing I would say is we have no clue how flu is gonna interact with COVID-19. And to be 100% honest, I hope that I don't have any personal people I know or any personal friends or any uh, patients that have to deal with that because um, we really have no idea. But we know that flu can be very severe in lots of people and we know that COVID-19 can be very severe in lots of people. And the overlap between the two could be um, a real problem. The unknown is terrifying in a lot of ways, right? And, and then also it does drive us to really appreciate and understand the significance of research um, and also just overall criti being critical um, in our questioning, which brings me to a point that you made earlier, where at the top of COVID, you and your colleagues were 
and, and the, the general consensus was children are safe, right? Or, or, or children will not be impacted as, in the same way that adults will be, right? And so that was, that was understanding one week and then the next week it was something different. And so as our understanding evolves, um, we still don't know everything about the novel coronavirus, right? It is novel. And, and you know, and, and the very nature of it being novel means we don't know everything, including the long-term impact of COVID-19 on young people, right? So I'm wondering, um, are you concerned about long-term impact? And if so, what 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 do you, what concerns you? I, I definitely am. There, there are, um, I would say, case reports mostly coming out in observational reports of. Um, of long lasting or longer than we anticipated lasting things like inflammation of the heart. So myocarditis of the heart, particularly in young athletes, um, there have been reports of that. There have been reports of things that sound sort of like uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, like symptoms, so very fatigued brain fog, things of that nature in adults and in children that seem to persist. Um, and we don't really understand the science behind all of that and why that happens. Uh, we know, you know, with the lungs, um, the receptors that the virus can attach to are very prevalent in the lungs, but they're also prevalent in the heart um, and in other parts of the body. And so, you know, the, the, the fact that SARS-CoV-2 can cause such a multi-organ um, issue um, in so many patients from things like strokes to um, myocarditis to this pneumonia-like ARDS picture um, to brain fog and other things of that nature, to funny uh, uh, dermatologic manifestations and COVID toes and all these other things. It's really hard to say at this point what it's going to do long term, right? But I think the fact that we recognize that there is a possibility that there are long term impacts of it is a good thing, which at the height of the pandemic, I don't think people were focusing on as much. Um, and so we want to make sure we know that people who have had asymptomatic or very mild symptoms can still have these long term sequelae so far. And so it's not just people who are hospitalized or people who um, become severely and um, seriously ill, it can still be people with mild illness. So, you know, I think kind of um, going against this idea that, oh, well, if I get it, it'll just be a flu is really important to get away from that because we, we know, number one, it's not just a flu, but number two, we have no clue what it's doing to other parts of the, of the bottom, other organ systems and other parts of the immune system, really, um, and what that is going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Um, it'll certainly keep researchers busy, right? And we hope we hope majority many of those researchers are people of color. That that is what we absolutely want to know. Um, okay, so talk to us about someone wants to know about um, pneumonia shots and and with respect to COVID, is is there a connection there? Is there a benefit to that? So and again, people, if you have questions, it's easier for me to see it in the Q and A as opposed to in the chat box. So there, there's not any great um, evidence that a pneumonia shot helps uh, with COVID-19. Um, you know, there's not evidence that it hurts with COVID-19 either. So in, in general, there are a few different types of pneumonia shots. There's one um, that we typically give older people, so people older than 65 years old, um, to prevent uh, the, the bacteria that causes um, streptococcus pneumonia. Um, and then there's one that we give in younger people, which is called Prevnar that you'll get kind of a series of as you're younger to protect you um, in that case, also from streptococcus and also actually from ear infections and sinus infections that are caused by the same bacteria. Um, there is, with other vaccines, there's some data that suggests that getting the vaccine itself may prime your immune system in some way to be able to respond better to um, kind of nonspecific uh, viruses and bacteria. So in that sense, it's possible that having been vaccinated, so having that challenge before um, could be helpful whenever you get challenged by something else like SARS-CoV-2. So it's not, you know, it's not 100% and it's not very clear evidence at all, but um, that theoretically it, it seems to make a bit of sense there um, in, in kind of general as far as just having a, a good immune system that is able to respond to things as they come along. Um Keiko, I'm wondering if you can show me those poll results again. I, they flashed on my screen and then I accidentally closed them out. Um, but as we're getting those up, I'm wondering, so because we know very little about long-term impact, 
how do you suggest that people stay abreast of new information and, and what are some tactics that you would um, caution people to use uh, with respect to just deciding for themselves what's right information and what's wrong? Yeah, so misinformation is um, a huge problem. Um, I would really recommend not going to social media to find information. So to the most popular thing on Facebook or Twitter or um, Instagram or whatever it is, I would I look at primary sources of information for this. So I want to know is has it been peer reviewed? Um, what were the methods in which they collected this data? Um, and kind of do the sen does does the consensus um, does it make sense? Does it, do the conclusions make any sense at all? And and really go through it with that. I um, at the beginning of the pandemic started doing that like once a week. I look over kind of the biggest papers that have come out in the previous week and try to wrap my brain around it. And I do a summary of it on <laughs> on social media, even though I told you not to look at social media. But um, <laughs> but you know it's it's a way for me to stay abreast of what is going on and to really, if I'm saying something, I want to make sure it's factually based, at least in the, the most up to date information, because we, as we mentioned, the information really is evolving um, every single day. But overall, if it's a secondary source like a WebMD or something like that, sorry, WebMD, I would say try to find the primary source of the information and just double check it to make sure it makes sense. You don't have to get into the nitty gritty of the entire paper. You can read the abstract, which usually has a good amount of information for lay people to see if it's, um, if it's coming from um, a good research group that did due diligence with the information that they're putting forth. And it's not just a headline on, um, on one of our news networks. So we're gonna give the people a test Right, with, um, with just one more poll question, right? So we're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll put this up here. We wanna know, especially given what we shared today, what do you think are the main drivers of the differences in COVID-19 race-related uh, child mortality? We'll go ahead and get that in there. Okay. So Akila, we're coming down to the last five minutes or so of conversation, and there's so much else I want to ask you, but I'm going to ask a cop out question, which is what, what do you want to say to the people? What do you want them to take away? What do you think is something that we haven't, we haven't dug, either dug deep into or, or haven't touched just yet today? Yeah, so I think one thing we haven't talked about is, um, is research as much with all this going on. So we talked about kind of the, the way to get good information that's out there. But one thing I've been trying to um, bring some attention to me and plenty of other people is really making sure the integrity of research is, um, is in place and that uh, many different populations of people are included in that research from a participant standpoint and from a researcher standpoint. Um, and so I really truly believe that the validity of science is um, harmed if uh, diverse groups of people are not included when we do research, um, when we come up with protocols, when we come up with hypotheses for what's happening with something. I feel like if you, if you leave people out, you're going to end up missing what's going on in those populations. So that's to say that black and brown people need to be included in research in general. Um, particularly, I think SARS-CoV-2 and drug development and uh, vaccine development research. And um, if they're not, I think the generalizability of the results that we get is in question um, to a certain extent. We know that subpopulations or subgroups of people sometimes respond differentially to different medications and vaccines for a variety of different reasons. And if you don't test people, if you have a homogenous group, then you never figure that out until all those drugs and medications are in the, um, in the marketplace. And then we start picking up on these reports. So I think that's uh, of utmost importance for that reason and because communities of color are so disproportionately impacted by this disease that we really need to um, have a chance to figure out exactly what's going on, exactly how people are going to respond um, to the different uh, treatments and vaccines coming forth. Um, the other thing I would note on researchers of color, underrepresented researchers of color, 
again, I think brings a richness to research protocols and hypothesis generation. Um, and, and without that, um, that, that viewpoint, I think science, again, really um, does not as well as it could do. It doesn't really meet the bar that we really want it to meet. And that comes from a, you know, we need people who are, are in that pipeline from elementary school to high school to college to postgraduate work who are interested in these things, who are exposed to these things so that they know that they want to do these things, right? Um, and so that once we have these protocols in place, participants can come and say, hey, there's someone who looks like me who's working here. I feel a bit more comfortable too. We know it makes a difference in terms of homophily between the provider and the patient. And while I don't know the research around researchers, you know, and in terms of um, the research as it impacts the communities that they're with, you know, most familiar with or uh, similar to, I would imagine that it still matters. It absolutely does matter, for sure. This is this has been um, a really very um, warm conversation, right? It's it's hard not to feel warm when you're talking about children. Um, but then also, there's a lot to take away from this. We have so much to do in terms of staying abreast of information, um, in terms of really understanding what the drivers are of COVID-19 in children. And in fact, let's see the final poll results to the question and see, make sure you know we were all on the same page about that. Boom, most of us, again, listened really well here. Um, yes, the main driver and the differences in COVID-19 related mortalities among children has to do with social determinants of health. And what we're basically saying, what you said, just to summarize, is it has everything to do with opportunity and the way that one's environment either um, perpetuates uh, their opportunity or stagnates their opportunity, right? Again, it's not necessarily just about what children do or don't do, right? Well, um, I think that we have reached the time, whenever Brandon comes on, that means it's time for me to shut up. But Dr. Akila Jefferson Shah, thank you so much for your time today. And um, we certainly wish you well in all that you're doing. I hope that you remain safe and your people remain safe um, as you're carrying out your work. Thank you thank for, you being for here. having me. Thank you. All right. Nah, well, thanks again, uh, Mia, as always, and Akila for all the information. It was really um, helpful, and I think we at least educated folks and let them know that the, you know, the main driver is social determinants of health at the end. Um, also want to thank, uh, if you didn't know, Akilah, um, before moving to San Diego and then going to Arkansas, worked for under our Lifetime Achievement Award this winner this year, Dr. Fauci. And so that's another reason we want to honor him because he's training our next generation of physicians and making sure that folks like Akilah are out there educating and helping in, in cities like San Diego and in rural places in Arkansas. So with that, uh, I'd like to let you go. Please, uh, as you all know, our summit is this Monday through Wednesday. So just sign up on our website if you want to hear more folks like Dr. Shaw, Dr. Jefferson Shaw. All right. Thanks, guys, and have a good day. <laughs>